Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. The title today is The Joys of Restoration. The Joys of Restoration. If you'll think back the last time I spoke, it was on the prodigal son, ruin and restoration, how he went from ruin and came back to restoration. I'd like to follow up with that and the joys that come when we come back to our Father, when we come to our heavenly home in worship of our King and we come into His kingdom as heirs. Uh, just to review, there were seven steps of downward decline to ruin. Those were our self-will, our selfishness, our separation, our sensuality, our spiritual destitution, our self-degradation, and our spiritual starvation. And then we see the restoration and the realization that we are desperate. And the resolution that we will arise and go back to our Father. And the repentance that we see that we are sinners. And then our returning to our Father. And then being reconciled by Him as He welcomes us in. He renews us. And then there is great feasting and rejoicing. I want to focus on that feasting and rejoicing of being reconciled to our Father. In the first five verses of Romans chapter 5, we will see what happens when we have true restoration in Jesus Christ, when we are fully His. We'll see that we find peace in verse 1. In verse 2, we're going to see that we have access to God. In verse 2, we're going to see that we have joy in God. Verse 3, we're going to glory in our trials. Verse 4, we will have patience. And verses five, verse 5, we'll have hope and the love of God. Now, in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives us a word picture of the father placing the ring of restoration on his son's hand. And this man has been restored to his sonship with the father. And Paul gives us that same description here in this passage when he shows us the beauty of being reconciled to our father. So let's just dive in. And we're going to just go th read these verses one at a time as we talk through them. So verse 1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why would we need peace with God? What would cause us to have to make peace with someone? You have to have been at war with them first. You had to have been separated. You had to have been enemies. If you were not enemies, peace would not need to be made. But we, all of humanity, has been at war with God for all of our lives until He comes into our hearts, until He opens us up. When Adam and Eve fell, when they separated them from the relationship that they had with God, mankind forevermore has been at war with God, has been fully separated. Just think about it. In the Garden of Eden, what did God come to do every evening? He walked with them. They were in His presence there was a friendship, a love, and God would come and be with them in the Garden of Eden. But they separated themselves. And from then on, all of mankind has been at war with God. Not that we disliked God a little bit. Not that we just didn't really want to be good friends with Him. We hated God. In our human state, in our sinful state, we hate everything about God. There is nothing in Him that brings us joy. There is nothing in Him that makes us happy. There is nothing in Him that we want when we are in our sins. We are the dog going back to its vomit. We're the pig wallowing in the mud. And we love it until He opens our eyes to see who He is. And then we realize that we were at enmity with God. We hated Him. But through Jesus Christ, you and I and all whom He has called have a peace with Him. A restored relationship. When there is war going on, there is constant fear. There's always a looking over your shoulder. There's always a waiting for the next bad thing to happen, the next battle to happen. Can you imagine now 
as believers, thinking that God Almighty was something that we should run away from instead of running to in the midst of those battles and in the midst of those wars, and yet that's what we did. We ran from His shelter as far away as we could until He opens our eyes to see our true state. Just as the prodigal son did, he wanted to get as far away from his father as he could because his father was his enemy. He loved nothing about the father. Nothing. He only loved what the father could financially give him. He cared nothing for him. But when he realized in the midst of the pigs in the mud, his desperate state, then he realized the goodness of his father. Now you imagine yourself in the midst of a war, in the one place of safety, the one bomb-proof shelter that nothing can penetrate is the thing we were running the furthest from in our war with God. But when you run into that shelter, no bomb, no fiery dart of Satan, no scheme of man, no scheme of the powers of this earth in this dark spiritual world can penetrate the shelter of God. And in that we find a true peace that is beyond description. It is a true peace in God. But it's our being justified by God Himself that causes us to no longer be enemies with Him. Therefore, what is the therefore referencing? The two verses before it. In chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and He was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Because God Himself has brought you into His shelter. God Himself has drawn you into His own safety. And says to you, we are not at war. You, we are allies and I will protect you. The herd is out there. But in here you will find peace and comfort. Now I tell you, there are times in my life where I feel the storms of the world. I feel the darts of Satan. And it scares me. And I become troubled. But when I run back to my shelter, to that impenetrable, bomb-proof shelter that nothing can get through, I feel the, the, the storms of the sea calm. And I might hear those darts of Satan hitting on that shelter. But I know I'm safe. I know they cannot get me. And I have a peace in knowing that I am His. Simply His. And that is a peace. That is a peace that brings true hope. It brings true joy. It brings true satisfaction in knowing that I am at peace with my master. The war is over between you and God. It is over. He conquered. And He has brought you into His fold. Verses 10 and 11 of Romans chapter 5 says, For if we were enemies, we are now reconciled by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received this atonement or this restoration. And in that we find a true joy that we could not comprehend outside of that shelter. And when we find that peace, we realize in verse 2, that we now have access by faith into His grace. Access to God? Now this is completely unheard of for the Hebrew people. The people of old, access to God. Think of Moses on the mountain. When God spoke to all of Israel, it was such a thundering, frightening experience that the people of God said they never wanted to hear the fearsome, Voice of God again because it was too much for them to bear. 
So they had to have Moses speak to God for them because they couldn't even handle that. And now, thousands of years later, Paul is saying, you have access to the very grace and the very voice of God. Therefore, in Hebrews chapter 10, let us come boldly before the throne of God. Don't come timid and fearful like the Israelites when they heard the voice of God. Come with boldness before His throne, knowing that because you were at peace with God, you can now come boldly before Him and you have access to Him. But man, if you're not at peace with God... How scary would it be to try to approach the maker of heaven? Because I tell you, one day, everyone will face Him. There will be fear and trembling for some, and there will be trembling and joy for others, but every knee will bow before that throne. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and some to their condemnation, and some to their eternal peace. So know now, that you have access to Him through that peace, that you yourselves can come before God. You're standing in a permanent position of grace. A permanent position of grace before His throne. You will never be His enemy again. He has purchased you and He will hold you fast. Will you have troubles? Yes, we'll get to the trials in a moment. But you will always have peace, even in the midst of those troubles. And as you have peace in your troubles, know that you always have access to your Savior. And then continuing on in that verse, by whom also we have access by faith into this grave, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have joy in our Restoration. A true joy in our restoration. Verse 11 says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What are we joying in God through Jesus Christ for? By whom we have now received our atonement, our restoration. We have true joy in Him. But what are we having all that joy in? It's our being joy, it's our joy in being with Him. Remember the prodigal son, the one that his brother that stayed there? His joy was never in being with his father. Never. His joy had always been in what can my father do for me. But his joy was never in his father. But now you have joy simply in him and in knowing him. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8. Speaking of Jesus Christ, says, Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. We have joy in the promise of hope of God's eternal life for us. That's where our joy is. We are hoping in him, we are hoping in eternity with him. We are not hoping in streets of gold. We are not hoping in a pearly gate. Those are beautiful things that we will get to enjoy, but that is not where our hope lies. Our joy in heaven is God. He is the light. He is the joy. He is the focus. Now, we may see loved ones, and I hate to say it, I don't like that song that says, I'm going home to see my mother. I'm going home to see my father. It's sweet. Those are going to be joyful occasions. You're going to heaven to see God. You're going to heaven to worship before His throne. That is all you need. That is all the joy that you could bear. You couldn't contain any more joy than being before His throne because that much joy will overflow abundantly. It is a joy unspeakable. I can't explain it good enough for you. I simply can't. It is a joy unspeakable. But know this, that you will be overflowing with a joy that you cannot describe or understand right now because you will be with Him. Yes, you'll have the benefits of seeing loved ones. Yes, it'll be cool to see if you could fly or float on a cloud. It'll be neat to see what those golden streets look like and actually see if there's a lion laying down with a lamb. That's going to be neat. 
but it's not going to be your joy. Your joy is in being before the throne of God Almighty because He has brought you back in. You are not His enemy. And when you go before His throne of judgment, you may go trembling, but you go with a full confidence in Jesus Christ and His salvation. You will bow that knee before that throne in a trembling joy, knowing of what is to come in eternity, worshiping God Almighty. That is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And that's what you see, receive in restoration to God. It's a joy unspeakable. Now let's keep in 1 Peter here for a moment. He says, you will have a joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. But look at the couple of verses that happen just before he speaks about your joy unspeakable. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Wherein greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes into this joy unspeakable after talking about a fiery furnace of a trial. You still have joy. So let's look at our next point. Verse 3 of Romans chapter 5. And not only so... Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations? Really? I'm supposed to glory in that? Why? Why would I want to glory in my persecution, these these trials of life that just seem to squeeze me? Imagine an olive press or or a wine press that's just squeezing the grapes till they are nothing but a pulp. And all of the juice of life has been squeezed from them. That's the fiery trials of life. And Paul is telling us here, you're to glory in that as well. And how am I supposed to glory in my trials? How am I supposed to do that? This whole world's got troubles. I've got troubles. You've got troubles. The world just seems to be getting worse and worse. But, I mean, you just cut the news out and just look at your own life. It just seems like there's trouble after trouble, temptation after temptation, failure after failure. And I'm to glory through my tribulations. Now, does that mean I succumb to my tribulations and say, Lord, you've laid it on me. I'm going to glory in just falling prey to my temptations. That's not what it means. It means you're glorying that he is testing you. You're glorying that He's putting you through, as 1 Peter says, the refiner's fire. He's talking about gold there. When you get that block of gold out of the mountain, it doesn't look like that pretty necklace you're wearing or that pretty gold ring. It's an ugly rock. And it has to be refined over and over and over and over. And it goes through this process of melting it down into a boiling liquid until every bit of the impurity is pulled out of it. That's what you're rejoicing in. You're saying, God, I don't like the trial, but I know what you're working through me in this trial. You're pulling away my love for the world in this trial. And you're drawing me closer to you. You're taking the world away. And you're making me more like Christ. As Romans 8 says, that we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the refiner's fire. And it's not fun. Rejoicing in it doesn't mean that you love the trial. It means that you're rejoicing in what God is doing to you and for you through this trial. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35 tells us this. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. We all know this passage. But he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Who's going to take you out of that bomb shelter of safety? Are all the battles of this world, the tribulations, the refiner's fire, will they take you away? Distress, your worries of life, will they take you away? Persecution for Christ's sake, will that take you away? Famine, 
nakedness or peril or sword, the death, dying? Can any of it take you out of his shelter of safety? Those are their tribulations. Those are the trials. And yet he's saying, I have joy in my tribulations. Why? Because nothing, nothing can take me from that throne room. Nothing can take me away from the hope that belongs to me through Jesus Christ. Nothing can take it away. I know where my hope lies. It is not in this world. It's not in my comfort here. As Mike said today, you may have trouble your whole life, but that is not where your joy lies. That is not where your hope lies. It is simply in seeing your Savior and coming before His throne. So even through those trials, and even through those tribulations, we have a joy unspeakable. And we can learn to glory in our trials. We can glory in them. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 says, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with an exceeding joy. Brothers and sisters, He's coming back one day. And I tell you on that day, there will be such shouting and such joy that you will not be able to contain yourself. If we're here on this earth alive when it happens, it's going to be an amazing sight. If you're already in heaven, you're going to be rejoicing for those that are coming to join you. Everyone will be rejoicing in Jesus Christ that is in the safety of His shelter and is at peace with Him. There will be joy. So learn to glory even in the midst of your trials because of what they are taking you to. Back to Romans chapter 5. Now this is the one that we all say don't pray for, but we all know that we're supposed to. Knowing this, that tribulation worketh patience. You ever heard the term, if you pray for patience, you better get ready because God's putting something before you to cause you to be patient. Do we really need to be praying for that? Well, Hebrews 10.36 tells you you should be praying for patience. It says that yes, we do need patience. And after we have patiently endured, we will receive His promises. And if you're not sure, even after reading that, Paul just gives you an extra chapter of Hebrews chapter 11 to make sure you know that the faith and the hope of the glory of God to come is all you need to give you for all the patience you need for all of this world. Because look at all the men and women in that hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11 who patiently walked in faith through every trial of this world in hope of a glory yet to come. And they received their reward of hope and glory. And they're rejoicing in it right now. Every one of those people named in Hebrews chapter 11 is feeling that joy that is unspeakable that you yourself will have one day. So be patient a little while longer. Be patient a little while longer and wait for His promises. We're able to persevere in the midst of the tremendous pressure and the squeezing of those tribulations. You're not going to get the olive juice without squeezing that olive. You're not going to get the grape juice without that grape being squeezed. We must have patience in our own tribulations, knowing of what is yet to come and knowing that we will come out better for it. That we will come out closer to God through those trials and tribulations. That we will come out closer to Him because we will have the cares of this world removed away. Through each refining fire, those cares of the world go further away. And our heart goes further towards our Savior. So be patient in your tribulation. And in that same verse, patience and experience. Experience means an approved and tried character. Because you have made peace with God through Jesus Christ, 
Because you have hope in Him and you have joy in Him even in the midst of your tribulation and all of the patience you've had to have through those tribulations, you come out now with the experience of an approved and tried character, a heart towards God. That doesn't mean they're easy, but you have endured through them. And that means you're developing a character for a heart towards God. James chapter 1 verse 12 tells us that blessed is the one who endures the temptations. Blessed are you when you have tried, been tried, and you have patience, and you have hope, and you endure through those tribulations. The blessings are unspeakable. The blessings are unspeakable. And this is the proof or the testing of our faith. We're either full of impurities and dross, or we are being refined and proven to have a character for God through the experiences of our trials, through our hope, through our joy, and through our patience. We are experiencing a godly character and a joy in Him. And then back to verse 4. And that experience, that approved and tried character, brings forth hope. Hope. Romans chapter 8, verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope? But we hope for that we see not. And then do we with patience wait for it. Now this hope is not a wish in the dark. That's a very different word than the hope that is used here. The meaning of this word means that we have a certainty of something that has not yet been realized, but we know it will. I'm not hoping with a wish and no expectation. It's just a wringing of the hands wish. This is a firm assurance. I have not seen it, but I know it. I have not seen it, but I am sure. I have not seen it, but I have been promised it by God Himself. And that is where your assurance lies. Because God has said it would be so. So I will rest upon that promise. And I will have such a hope that nothing can waver me from it. No trials of this life will take my hope from His promises. At the joy that I will have in Him. We realize this hope when we see ourselves made whole in Jesus Christ. It's not a wish. It's an assurance. A peaceful, calm assurance of what I have in Jesus Christ. We're saved from His wrath and made peace with Him by Jesus Christ. And that is where our hope lies. David said that his fainting or longing for the salvation of God And that his hope in this salvation is through what? Through God's Word. Psalm 119 verse 81. He is longing for salvation, but he hopes with a calm assurance in that salvation to come. And David is now rejoicing with a joy unspeakable because he rested assured in the words of God's promises. Romans 15.4 tells us that we believe in the promises of God through our hope in Him. That what we can even find our hope in death. You even have hope in death. Death has no sting. Grave is not, the grave is not a conqueror. God Himself has overcome both the grave and death. And that is where your hope is because you know that you have an eternal assurance of peace and joy and glory with Him forever. And you hope in it even in the face of death. Nothing, nothing can shake that hope. Proverbs 14.32 says, The righteous has his hope in death. Because we know what comes. We know that we are just pilgrims here on this earth and that our glory is yet to come and our rejoicing is yet to come and our treasure is not here. 
Our treasure is God. And we will worship Him in fullness at that throne room. So we are looking for that blessed hope of the appearing of Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. So lay hold of it. Grasp firm to that anchor of hope for the soul. We'll have times where we want to waver. We're going to have times where the waves may start taking us away. Grasp hold of that anchor of hope. Rest assured in it that He is your anchor in the midst of all the trials. Your hope is in Him. And He is steady. And He is sure. And He is your safety. And then the last one. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We are full of the love of God when we have made peace with God. When we are in His shelter, we are surrounded by His presence. God's love is generously poured out towards us. Generous because we did nothing for it. Generous because we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We're not good enough for it. Chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God commendeth His love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were His enemies outside of the bunker, running away from Him, out into the darkness of the world, running towards the judgment of God, Christ Himself gave His own life to bring you into the safety of His shelter while you were running from Him, despising Him and fighting against Him. While you hated Him and mocked Him, He poured forth His love over you. Generous love for us. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7 says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You remember when the prodigal comes running home? He's still filthy. He's still covered in the smell of pigs and mud and sweat and tears. But He is, has placed on Him that robe of righteousness. He has placed on His feet those shoes of love. And that ring of restoration is placed on Him. He came in filthy and the love of the Father was poured over him just as it was you and me. And John, 1 John chapter 3 says, Look at what an amazing love has been bestowed upon us by the Father that we should be His heirs. That we should be brought into His safety. That we should be loved. What amazing love is this? But God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive while we were dead. Ephesians chapter 2. There is much joy in being the subject of our Master. Of being bound in His safety, we then find joy. The prodigal wanted freedom to get as far away as he could. And in his freedom, he found nothing but destruction. Only when he realized that under his father's care was he truly safe, fed, happy, and loved. Brothers and sisters, hold on to those joys of restoration. Know that you are at peace with God. Know that you have access to his throne now that he hears your cries. Know that you have joy now but you will have a joy unspeakable and full of glory when we are in eternity with Him. And know that you're going to face trials, but in those trials we can find glory knowing 
that we are being made like Christ. And then therein we can have patience. And that patience produces character. That character produces a hope because of the love of God over us. So joy in your restoration today. Don't scoff at it. Look at it and find joy in knowing that you are His. Let's pray. Holy Father, we are in awe of such a love that just as the prodigal son, Lord, we were covered in a disgusting, unclean filth. We had rejected you with every bit of our heart, scorned you, wanted to be as far from you as we could, and yet in our filthy state, you still loved us. You didn't wait for us to come up that long walk of a driveway. You came running towards us and you grabbed us and you kissed us and you rejoiced over us. Not because we had done anything, Lord, but because you chose to love us with your son's blood. That through that blood, Lord, we, those who were at war with you, those who hated you, would have a true peace and a hope and a joy in you now. But Lord, knowing of what is yet to come at our glory with Jesus Christ, worshiping you on that throne. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.